Um, hello, I'm Judy Fridovich Kyle. Um, I'm a professor in the Department of Human Genetics in the School of Medicine at Emory University, which is in Atlanta, Georgia. Yes, um, hello. I, hi, I'm Jerry uh, Berry. Uh, uh, I'm a, uh, a professor of, uh, at the Harvard Medical School. Uh, I'm also the uh, director for metabolism or biochemical genetics at the Boston Children's Hospital. Uh, and I'm also the, uh, the director for the biochemical genetics uh, training program for the Harvard Med Medical School. Thank you so much for this opportunity to speak with members of the glycosemia community and, and hopefully the broader community. Jerry and I are really delighted to be able to give a little bit of a background overview of galactosemia. Galactosemia is a family of disorders resulting from impaired ability to metabolize galactose. So the word galactosemia actually means excess galactose in the blood. Um, and how does that happen? Well, galactose gets into the body in either of two ways. Either it comes in through the diet, so that's the, the faucet <laughs> dripping into the tank on the left-hand side, but our bodies can also make galactose. Every single cell in your body, as far as we know, can make galactose, and so that's the little faucet dripping into the tank from the right. In terms of dietary galactose, the main place we get dietary galactose is from dairy milk. So human breast milk has about 19% of calories from galactose, so that's a lot. Cow's milk has about 15% of calories from galactose, that's also a lot. And your body can metabolize the lactose in milk to galactose and glucose, and so that adds to the tank. How does galactose leave the tank? Well, through a process that we call metabolism. And on the next slide, we will get a little into the detail about galactose metabolism. So, Jerry? Well, it's a real pleasure to be here today and to participate in this important event. So, how is galactose normally metabolized? It's, it's metabolized in the body through a special pathway called the Loire pathway. Type 1 galactosemia is the, is the disorder that we most commonly talk about. It is due to GALT deficiency. And GALT, GALT is, is the short name for a complicated enzyme name called the galactose 1-phosphate uridyl transferase. Galactose comes into the body, and then it has to undergo a sequence of chemical reactions. The first one uh, involves the enzyme galactokinase. Uh, and this goes by the abbreviation of GALK. In this enzyme reaction, the galactose is converted to galactose 1-phosphate. Now, the next reaction that should happen is the conversion of the galactose 1-phosphate to UDP galactose. And that's what is missing in classic galactosemia. As you can see above that, the, the arrow that's pointing in both directions, it says galactose 1-phosphate uridyl transferase. So all, the, all of the bad things that happen in type 1 galactosemia due to the GALT deficiency are all because of this simple inability to convert that galactose 1-phosphate to UDP galactose. The UDP galactose that's formed can then be transformed back again into a UDP glucose. And the UDP glucose is, in fact, then something that needs to interact with the galactose 1-phosphate uh, to produce the UDP gal. So this is, this is a cycle, so to speak. The conversion of the UDP galactose to the UDP glucose happens because of the enzyme called GALA. So this is the Loire pathway. Type 1 galactosemia or GALT deficiency can be subdivided uh, for simplicity's sake into three forms. Classic galactosemia, uh, which, which has less than 1% residual GALT activity. The clinical variant form of galactosemia, which is associated with 1 to 10% of GALT residual activity. 
and the Duarte or biochemical variant form of galactosemia test and, and is associated with uh, on average 25% gold activity. Classic galactosemia is an autosomal recessive disorder. Uh, this means that both mother and father are carriers for the mutation. They have one gene or allele that works well, and then another one uh, that is the galactosemic one. Each parent uh, with any conception has a 50% chance of, do of donating the, the, bad, the bad gene to the baby. And if both do, then that will result in a baby that has two copies of the genes that don't work. But please recognize that with each conception, uh, there, there's a, a core chance that the patient will have the disease, uh, but there's a 75% chance that the, that the uh, baby will not have it. There's a 50% chance that the baby would be a carrier, and then a 25% chance that the baby would have two copies that is normal. Type 2 galactosemia is gawk deficiency, which is uh, very rare, and type 3 uh, galactosemia, which is gale deficiency, and is subdivided into three forms. Not every case of galactosemia results from GALT deficiency. That's what Jerry just explained in, in looking at the Loire pathway. There are two other enzymes that um, the GAL-K and the GAL-E, and there are human beings born who have problems with those enzymes. Um, most of our time for the rest of, of today, though, will be spent talking about GAL-T deficiency. And then even within GAL-T deficiencies, they're not all the same, and it's extremely important to, to keep that in mind. Um, we are going to be talking about classic galactosemia, and this graph, so these are just box and whisker plots from a paper that we published a long time ago, and these are actual uh, clinical lab results for individuals looking at the GALT activity in their red blood cells, and what you can see is that, see the red arrow pointing at the CG, so there we have 22 individuals, and you can see that all of them have almost undetectable to undetectable GALT activity. The folks who are listed as NN, so those are the basically uh, normal controls. There's a, a broad range, but they all have really nice GALT activity. And you can see the, the different categories. But for the rest of, of this session, we will be talking about true classic galactosemia, which is the, the folks who, who really have no to almost no uh, residual activity. And one of the really blessings of the uh, second part of, of the 20th century was the initiation of newborn screening. To briefly summarize, when the baby is born, um, they collect some drops of blood, usually from the child's steel prick. A little image of that slide showing a, what's called a Guthrie card after Bob Guthrie, who, who started this program. Uh, it's important to recognize that newborn screening, although it is federally mandated, each state gets to decide for themselves how they're going to do it. And so although some states started in the early to mid 60s testing every newborn to see if they had galactosemia, there were some states that did not add it to their panel until 2004. It's called newborn screening um, because it is, it is intended um, to be fast, to be effective um, and to be economical um, because they're doing it on lots and lots of babies and they set thresholds so that hopefully they will never miss a true positive and it means they have a lot of false positives. Um, so if a child in the state lab is identified as having undetectable GALT activity, the, the pediatrician is notified, the family is notified and is told, stop breastfeeding that baby put them on a low galactose formula. Typically that's soy, but there are other options as well. And quickly bring the baby back in, we need to do follow-up testing. And follow-up testing generally means they're gonna collect a fresh blood sample and it's gonna to go to a lab that is gonna do very quantitative tests, um, looking for a number of different things. They're gonna do a very quantitative test for GALT activity and they're gonna ask, you know, is it undetectable? Is it 25% nor, you know, 
what is the activity? They will get out a number and that will be very informative. They also will generally look at metabolites. So galactose 1-phosphate is typically a metabolite that is looked at, but they could also look at others. Anyway, so generally to actually diagnose galactosemia, you need to have a quantitative assay looking at enzyme activity, and that's usually done from red cell, red blood cells. And they typically also want to look at the metabolites. Oftentimes, there is also genetic testing. So they will isolate some DNA from blood and look for mutations. Sometimes they look for a panel of common mutations. Sometimes they actually sequence the GALT gene to look for rare mutations. Again, it's done differently in different places. So that is diagnostic testing. So here we're looking at a graph. We're asking what is the prevalence of, of classic galactosemia? And really the, the, one of the best ways to identify prevalence of a condition in a population is if you have truly population newborn screening or population screening. And so here you can see a, a bunch of states um, listed by their uh, two letter code um, on the bottom and the number of years of data that I was able to get from them. And that's plotted. In general, for pretty much all the states, the prevalence is about one in 50,000 screened births. Several decades ago, most, most physicians felt that classic galactosemia was treatable. And the only thing that one needed to do was to have the newborn baby stay away from breast milk or a formula that has galactose in it or, or something that's associated with dairy products and the baby finds. However, what we have learned in the past 25 to 30 years is that, yes, the positive newborn screen enables an immediate dietary restriction of galactose, but there are other problems that still exist. Despite early diagnosis and lifelong dietary restriction of galactose, many infants with classic galactosemia grow to, to experience a constellation of long-term developmental problems. And while the newborn screening is wonderful because uh, it allows for intervention right away in the first few, first few days uh, of, of life, it allows the the jaundice or vomiting or diarrhea or failure to thrive and cataracts, liver enlargement uh, uh, to disappear, as well as these most feared complications of E. coli sepsis. It does all that, but what it can't do is prevent the vast majority of patients with classic galactosemia of having a delay in speech and or a speech defect or, or having a delay in their development, or having problems with learning in school, or for almost all the females to have normal ovarian function. Many of those indi individuals are unable to have a, uh, to, to give birth to a baby. Also, uh, there are a few, thankfully, usually under 50% of individuals in different studies that actually have more severe complications that involve the nervous system and can result in abnormal movements or even, even an inability to, to walk without assistance. So again, these are long-term complications that occur no matter how early the baby was switched to a low galactose formula. So even if the baby never drank a drop of milk and, and very, very rigorously um, restricted galactose from the diet, we see um, a much higher prevalence of these complications in people with galactosemia than in, for instance, their unaffected sibling. Um, so again, these are actual data um, from people who participate in, in uh, one of our studies. Starting on the left, you can see the outcome of, of speech. And, and here, because we people with galactosemia live all over the place and we we did not have the ability to test them all. We asked, well, who has, who has received speech therapy? And we picked a, an age period where it was likely not gonna be preventative, but, but actually responsive to a problem with speech. 
And so you can see that we have uh, the patients. These are people with classic galactosemia in the, in the left um, bar and controls. So those are unaffected siblings in the right bar. And some of the controls needed speech therapy, but not many. And about half or, or even more than half of the people with classic galactosemia uh, received speech therapy. And here we're looking at receipt of other special educational services. So typically these were children who were struggling um, with academic subjects in school who were receiving some kind of special educational um, help. And depending on the school system, um, exactly what the help was uh, varied from, from ch child to child. Again, you can see that the, the kids who do not have classic galactosemia, some of them, but not many of them needed special help. Um, but more than half of the kids with classic galactosemia um, needed special services. Then we're looking at something called prepubertal growth delay. So what that means is that uh, if you looked at the heights of the parents and you calculated uh, what the predicted height of the child would be at a, at a particular age, and you looked at the actual height of the child at that age, were they where you expected them to be? Were they uh, shorter than you expected them to be? Or were they taller than you expected them to be? And that's the Z-score. And I think you can see that for the controls, that, that median is right on zero, which is they were where you expected them to be. Now that's the median. Of course, there are always some kids who are a little taller or shorter than you expected. If you look at the patients, I think you can see that the median is below, that the median is the horizontal bar in the middle of the box. So again, there's a broad range and there are some very tall kids with classic galactosemia, but as a group, they were shorter than expected. And this was prepubertal. They, they generally tend to have a slightly later puberty. They keep growing and, and they do catch up um, usually by the time they're adults. Um, the next graph looks at adaptive behaviors. So these are the behaviors that people do to get through their you know, everyday lives, uh, taking care of themselves, interacting with other people, interacting with the environment. And here we, we used an, a, a standard and, and, and well um, known study called the Adaptive Behaviors Assessment uh, System uh, version three. And again, you can see that the controls, the median for the controls was actually a little bit above 100. 100 would have been considered um, average. So we have some very well adapted families, I guess. And the, the patients, again, there's a broad range and some of them are doing great. Um, some of them are really struggling. Most are somewhere in between, but again, the median is substantially below um, the, the median for the controls. The next set over is looking at scholastic achievement using standardized tests that are given in schools. Many school systems give standardized tests in math and in language arts, and children are um, assessed and, and scored as to whether they are achieving at or above grade level or below grade level in each of these subjects, math and language arts. And I think you can see that for the controls, 94% of them were achieving at or above grade level in both subjects, and 6% of them were at or above in one subject but below in the other. For the siblings with classic galactosemia who were raised in the same households, going to the same school systems, living in the same geography, um, you can see that it split almost a third, a third, a third in terms of, again, some of them are doing great, some of them are struggling in both subjects, and some of them are, are, are in between. Um, so the last set of graphs um, on the right-hand side refers to the motor control issues that Jerry was talking about. Now, there, there can be motor control issues that affect uh, gross motor skills or fine motor, um, here, we actually used a, a digital system that, that assessed fine motor control with, with the hand. Um, and so what you can see is that um, the, the lighter the color of the bar, um, basically the, the better their fine motor control was. So for the controls, um, some of them had a little bit of trouble, but most of them were doing just fine. And for the patients, you can see that, again, about half of them had no problems with the task we gave them, but the other half had either a little bit of trouble or a lot of trouble um, with the task. And so that is um, 
just more evidence that we really have not cured this disease. So there's a lot of, of variability and that is one of the, you know, one of the challenges I think for families when they're looking at their beautiful baby saying, is my baby gonna have problems with speech or problems with, you know, name, name your outcome. At this point, it is very difficult to know. Identifying it early by newborn screening is, is wonderful and it is life-saving. Um, and switching the diet again is life-saving but it is, not, it is not giving every member of the galactosemia community a kind of outcome that I think we, we would want them to have that, that their unaffected siblings are enjoying. And so that brings us to the last slide where we just stress that this is a disease, this is a community um, that really needs and deserves better interventions. It is very clear that dietary restriction resolves the acute symptoms or even better prevents the acute symptoms, but does not prevent the long-term complications. So that's where, really where we're focusing attention now is on the long-term complications. And the challenge is that the mechanism really is not understood. And, and I don't just mean Jerry and I don't understand it, we don't, um, but I don't think anybody really understands how to connect the dots at this point between well, we know this enzyme is missing. We can identify the mutations. We can look at metabolites. So we know that galactose builds up. We know that galactose 1-phosphate builds up. We know that galactitol builds up. In an animal model, what we've seen is that the metabolites that accumulate are, are even in different proportions in different tissues, suggesting that the, the mechanism of, of pathophysiology may be different in different tissues. So at this point, this is, this is our, our group challenge. Many of us are working very hard trying to find better interventions to help prevent and hopefully even modify or minimize long-term complications. And we don't, we don't know exactly what the best way to do this is gonna be. Many of us are trying different options and we dearly, dearly hope uh, that in our lifetimes, hopefully in the near future, we will have better options for families with classic galactosemia. So thank you.